Hello, everyone. So great to see you all here. Thank you for being here to support the WOM. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Judith Thorne. I want to tell you a little bit about her before I bring her up here on the stage. So Judith Thorne is a professor of interdisciplinary studies. Um, she created the first popular culture course focusing on the history of hip hop in the US. And I just want to point out that this, is, this was the first ever hip hop course in the United States, and it was here. Um, Judith is primarily interested in cultural theory because it offers tools to see diverse situations and not simply set answers to unique situations. Ms. Thorne's work has not gone, not gone unnoticed. The United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization funded Ms. Thorne to work in the library at St. Marshall in Port Al Prince, Haiti, um, in their collection of 10,000 books on the history of slavery. Ms. Thorne has received five National Endowment for the Humanities fellowships on subjects as diverse as Bakhtin and the Bible, 16th century literature and maps, and intensive studies in Mayan culture. In addition, she was honored with the Elizabeth Carlson Award for her outstanding contributions to SRJC. In Professor Thorne's words, the best education is one that leaves us with more questions than answers. An education which serves no purpose other than to relate and consume data won't give us any tools to help us get through the day. If we keep examining the bigger picture, we can see why we need to keep assessing how we came to be in this place in our lives. Please join me in welcoming Professor Thorne, who will provide us with tools to examine the brief wondrous life of Oscar Wilde, and who will undoubtedly help us examine the deeper issues present in this text, thus allowing us to examine our own places in the world and in relation to these issues. Please welcome Dr. Judith Thorne. working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's in my glasses. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. And uh, I want to say that any person uh, can become all of the things that uh, the introduction said that I was because I was one of those kids who was never the right person in any situation and despite all the obstacles that I had, one of which is not being able to connect slides with writing, and that's why I have Rafael Vasquez here to help me, um, you can still do it and you can still do something that uh, has merit, so don't ever forget that. That's my major contribution to you for today. You can do it. Anyway, um, thank you for showing up. That's the first thing, for listening to this presentation, and some of you may wonder, why um, this book is as great as they say it is. And some of you may not have started to read and you're just hoping for the bit of uh, inspiration that'll give you some sort of a key to a topic that you can write and turn out your A paper. Maybe yes. And uh, some of you uh, will already uh, have read this book or be a fan of it like I am. I think this is one of the really great books and it really disturbs me to find out that uh, of uh, hundreds of English classes that only 20-some chose to read this book for whatever reason. Um, it shows you something that's very, very important about how we pick and choose what it is that we study and how our linear uh, ab availability uh, just shoots us in the foot every time. We need to learn about other people and what they have to say, not just about us, but about themselves. So that's another thing that's really crucial. So there's going to be a PowerPoint. This is Juno Diaz, right? And um, I'm going to try to announce the big categories as I go along, and I have it written down because I tend to be uh, much more rangy in the way that I talk, and it makes people nuts. So I have it written down, so I'm uh, sorry for reading it to you. Any person who is interested in a copy of the text of this or the video that I use or anything like that can get in touch with me through the English department. I don't teach there, but people know where I live. And I'm glad to give it to you. It's not top secret information. This is just something I want to share. Okay, so the first slide we have is the creator of Oscar uh, and the embodiment of the character Junior, who is called Juno Diaz. Then we have a quote from Edwidge Dandekat, a woman and a writer from Haiti whose novels are important to the culture of the Americas um, <clears throat> to the Haitian world, where she comes from, and to the life of exiles. 
In her quote, she says that this narrative used street language of New Jersey uh, and creates something grand enough to offend the old idea of great literature, and I have a feeling that's one of the reasons that the entire English department didn't choose this text. So what we're going to find out is uh, how did Juno Diaz pull this off? Then we have next our map of Haiti. So you know where that is. It's Haiti in the Dominican Republic. You can see that the DR in Haiti, if you go to the left-hand upper corner, you see that Cuba is right there, 90 miles away. I don't have my pointer either. I thought of that. So you know that Cuba is 90 miles off the coast of Florida. So we're talking about people that you could practice. If you could walk on water, you could get there, right? It's really quite close. <coughs> And uh, we need to know that uh, this island is the first place and the only place, it was the closest place, uh, to the mainland of the Americas that Columbus ever got. That's crucial. He landed in Santo Domingo. And it was split between the Dominican Republic, Santo Domingo, San Dominique, as they called it in French, and Haiti, uh, which uh, the people who lived there said was the island that goes on forever. It's really quite beautiful. And then our next slide shows us New Jersey, just in case you've never been there. Okay, now. So what questions are we going to try to answer during the next 45 minutes? The first is, what is the function of narrative, and how does vernacular in this book create something grand? On a bigger and more theoretical plane, what is the relationship between language and meaning? And a corollary question, if you write a novel and everyone sounds and speaks the same, how can you tell the difference of pe between people in terms of origins, language, and social class? That's a crucial problem. So when all novels were um, for one class of people who were literate, the others couldn't read, of course, and therefore were illiterate. It was only a glaring omission, but the non-literate classes didn't matter anyhow and were not included in anything, not as artists or in novels. And even today, Zora Neale Hurston's book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, have any of you read that? Okay. It says on the back, and I just saw this in Texas the other day, the beautiful edition, it calls it folk literature. Um, why isn't it real literature? Why this dichotomy? And what is the difference between folk writing and real writing? And to admit that a peasant or an ordinary individual had anything valuable to contribute intellectually was an impossible idea. To honor the contributions of people who were not similar to the educated white classes was to admit that the educated white classes in America and Europe were not as singular as they set themselves up to be, the arbiters of everything. They were not God's agents in determining value. And this is a problem of what we call epistemology, or the origin of power. So now we have the ultimate question. How can someone enter a narrative if they don't exist for the people who read? Does that make sense to you? OK. Do we have the? So when black Americans began to write, um, <clears throat> and there was bi bilingualism, right, that was considered imperative for the upper educated classes, right? So people who, got, who were in the upper classes of the East Coast of, the, of America, which is the only thing that counted at the time, these folks went to college, got an education, went to Europe to do the grand tour, and they all spoke uh, two languages at least, right? Even my mother, who was a high school educated person, spoke four languages. Now, I have never understood how people who speak Spanish as a first language and then learn to speak English are not equally bilingual, bilingual with people who speak English and learn Spanish or French as a second language. That is a problem that we could address for hours. Possibly. Because historically, we as a country refer back to the French, right? In fact, when I was in college, um, that was the language you learned. So I got a degree in English literature and then in French, right? Spanish didn't exist for us. The class and value system which prevailed through the Victorian era 
was contested in the late 19th century. This sort of block of assumptions was contested. And when Euro-Americans in the United States engaged the Harlem Renaissance in the 20s, the question of what or whose language to use became imperative, right? It became a concern uh, for writers of African descent. Now, a schism developed among African writers of English within two opposing camps. One belonged to Booker T. Washington and the other to uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Both were articulate spokesmen for black people in the Americas, but they have very different consequences. And at the time, when the East Coast thought of color, they saw primarily a black-white dichotomy. Yeah, there were other outliers. For example, there were Catholics, Italians and Irish, who were both Catholics, both immigrants here, who were made honorary white people at the uh, time of the Columbian Exhibition at the turn of the last century. And um, the history of Californians, Spanish speakers and indigenous people, and here we are in California, was not included in the history of uh, the United States when you lived on the East Coast because Yankee writing was privileged. And as a child, I had no idea that Mexico lost 55% of its land mass to a land grab that came from the Roosevelt <laughs> uh, after the Alamo. I mean, this whole situation was unheard of and never mentioned uh, in history in high school and college at East Coast. So I only knew, not, I mean, know nothing about 1848 and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which guaranteed people to write to speak Spanish in California, in all of California, which was Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, et cetera, and California. I only knew about Davy Crockett and that from TV with his bloody coonskin cap, right? And what myth-making can that possibly represent? That the people of the Californias are completely occluded in the history of the, of the uh, United States, but we know that, that uh, Davy Crockett was king of the wild frontier. What's the frontier? That's where these people lived. So that's crucial to remember as well. But my ignorance did not change the fact that millions of people lived here and did good work they were just not included in the textbooks. That is crucial to remember as well. And it didn't become, uh, well, I say eradicated. It's not eradicated yet, apparently. But it, the erasure didn't start to be, um, what do you call that word? Remediated until the 60s, when we had all of these um, power movements where people began to understand about their consciousness, the black power movement, the uh, movement of Chicanismo, uh, which you can see in Cesar Chavez if you go to the movie, right? Okay. And because of their presence, blacks and later island people, and I'll talk about that later, argued about the hierarchy of language. What do these people share in common, the blacks and the island people? Well, first off, they're all descendants of slaves. and all were products of a diaspora. And here's the big question that they asked. Should we mimic whites in order to publish our books? Or should be true to our roots and speak the way we speak to each other? This is critical. Should black Americans write and speak only the king's English? And when we talk about speaking the king's English, to whom do we refer? Most of the kings of England from uh, well, from the 12th century on, we're French-speaking, except for our pal, uh, who was married to Victoria? Alfred, right, is that his name? Albert, yeah, do you have Prince Albert in a can? You better let him out, I remember now. Um, so anyway, he spoke German. So what we have is this amazing assumption that always and forever in our history that English has been the language of everyone, but it's just not true. It wasn't even true in the country that purported um, to make it the only way to be. So we have a serious problem. And, and some other forces at work here, and it's been disguised. Language is not a pure form. I guess you might have noticed that, but not to have it validated. New words in our vocabularies. 
invasions, say the one in 1066, which is called the Norman invasion, you know, I'm Alfred, you're king, okay, gave us the complexity of cattle, cow, and beef. And beef comes from the French word boeuf, right? It's just a corruption because the British at that time didn't have a uniform spelling. And why does this all matter? Because it's the history of how we got to be in this place, right? And I want to talk more about vernacular and language later, but the other English, other than the King's English, was called vernacular English, and that was a pejorative, right? So what is vernacular, and what does it mean? It means a slave born in the master's house. This doesn't come from America. This comes from Rome, when Seneca said that there were so many slaves, and you couldn't tell them from the people that owned them because they were all the same group of people. It's a very different story. He suggested that they all have to wear different outfits. All slaves are wearing blue, and then we'll wear everything else, or something like that. So it's a real problem. And the sl how is the question is how is a slave born in his master house different from one who's not? And if you take the American plantation system, you had people, yes sir, no sir, you know, yes master, no master, doing whatever in the big house, and then you had field workers, and those field workers didn't get to hear anything from the big house except the overseer saying work harder or whatever they said. They basically, I think, spoke with a whip. So. Um, they didn't have that access. So we have slave born in the master's house. The language which kind of copies the actual spoken language. And there's no reason to believe that all of these slave owners were literate people who spoke the king's English either. So that's just another aside. Okay. So let me reiterate that slaves who came here often spoke multiple languages, but they were not understood by the people who owned them. That's the first problem. This, so they were not English speakers, and English is what counts, so you're nothing, right? But um, the situation was very, very problematic. So when African Americans or black Americans began to write books and be published, which is this breaks big chasm in, in the culture of the United States, which we can talk about it at length, they wanted to know, do we write in the language of the classes who are used to control us or own us, or do we, do we speak as we do when we are amongst ourselves? I.e., how can you tell the difference in a person who speaks in terms of class, language, and social status if everybody speaks this sort of highfalutin English that I was raised to, sp to speak when I learned how to get through English literature? It's a real problem. It's not a problem uh, for the people who maintain and have only one language, but it is a problem in order to be part of the picture of people who are in the culture, in the cultural mirror, let's say. Okay, so now we got Booker T and W.E.B. Du Bois. These are the two guys that really matter. Now my friend Phyllis Allen, who named this paper, um, I just saw her in Texas, and she told me, that white English was like difference in my mouth. That she struggled as a child, and she was one of the bright tent that got, got ahead because even though she was dark skinned, she had hazel, hazel colored eyes, so she got to go to the good schools, et cetera, et cetera. She mastered her native and her family and colloquial language, and she also mastered this model that we call the King's English. And when she writes, um, the patois, as they call it despairingly, uh, comes out and it's beautiful and it's enchanting, but a whole nother world opens up when someone speaks a language which is their, their birth language or their native tongue. If you speak Spanish as a first language, you know that there's this thing called sentimientos imparables, a way that you just can't say it in English. And it's a problem for translators. Language carries with it a level of ideology, the things that stand uh, for it, and that's crucial. Okay, so I'm getting ahead of myself. So I want to tell you right now that I think that Juno Dias has blown this either or dichotomy out of the water. He's blown it to smithereens. He gives us a third road, which is planted directly between these two ideas of Debose and uh, Booker T, and I said the MGs, right? I said that to Raphael, 
Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, where uh, one said it was a problem to not speak the king's English because we need to pass, we need to get in there. And the others who said, I don't want to give up who I am just to get involved in the literary exercise. So this was a real big problem. And it might, as I say, might not have been a problem uh, for Euro-Americans who only spoke English, but it was a problem for African-Americans. How do I present myself within the pages of a novel? Do I let it go like Huck Finn, uh, where some white person represents my language? Or do I speak the way I actually speak? And there's a whole culture that grew up around this. <clears throat> so Juno gives us, gives us this third row to hoe, right? This, uh, a language which is alternatively Spanish, bilingual, non-English, vernacular, and erudite. He kicks this monolingual thing to the curb. And this is the, one of the keys uh, to the power of his book. The complexity in Juno Diaz is astonishing, especially in Oscar Wilde. And the ways in which he uses language is both eclectic and profound. He has said that he never read a book till he got to college. He didn't have any opportunity to do so, right? And that might have saved him <laughs> uh, in framing his books. He teaches at MIT now, just so you don't think that he is actually the secret idiot uh, who doesn't follow the rules. He teaches at MIT, where his students are not English majors. They're people who want to write. And that's a big difference. And they write in inspiring and interesting ways, he says. And you can catch him on the web. There's 10,000 uh, Juno Diaz blabs on the web. And every time I listen to him, I say, holy Toledo, this guy's awesome. I love it. He couldn't teach English in a junior college, but he could teach at MIT or at Harvard or at Yale. And he also you know, got a lot of literary prizes. So we're not talking about a person whose default position is stupidity, but one whose default position is power. And don't forget that. He has the power of language at his side. OK. Now, he writes, uh, oh, back to the screens. We got, oh, W.E.B. Du Bois, OK. So we, he talks about this double consciousness, meaning like it's like schizophrenia, right? And some of these people who are schizophrenic are going to be in this small percentage of people who get ahead and be able to manage the language and everything. There's a lot of shame involved in this, but every idea comes within a cultural context. So we don't have time to unpack this, but just know that this was really crucial. Uh, and then I, he said, these are his words, African Americans, even as they have sought to build from within a full sense of self-authenticity, which in Spanish is auto-identificarse, understanding yourself, uh, have had to exist in a nation where the fundamental symbolic structures continually place them in the position of other. Remember that. You could, that's something to remember for the rest of your life. For any person who is not born at East Coast, and et cetera, et cetera. OK, now we have, do we have anything about, do we have another one? OK. So for Booker T. Washington, vernacular was disempowering because the model was speaking the king's English, but nobody had gotten to the point that they decided, well, no, none of the kings spoke English, right? So what is it, what's this all about? This is about power coming from another place, but we're going to have to talk about it later. That uh, actually comes from a book that you might actually like to read called Spectacular Vernacular by Russell Porter on page 57. OK, now. Then Juno Diaz says, uh, motherfuckers can read a book that's one-third elvish and put two sentences of Spanish in it, and white people think we're taking over. <laughs> now, this man is on point, as they say, right? I love to listen to him talk because he had all these five-syllable words, and then he'll say, motherfucker, whatever. Um, but it's not because he's stupid or he doesn't know better. He does it with purpose, and there's the big difference in just uh, swearing because you're an idiot. Okay, next. Mm. OK, so I want to tell you something that this vernacular, which is the slave born in the master's house, remember that? It's from Latin, not from the United States, is actually often used as a form of resistance. And this is the side that the people who have the power don't look at. Who erodes the dominant culture? The people on the margins. And they may not blow it up, 
but they can't erode it. They're just feel, all the people that are occluded, they're just always busy clawing until it just gets like flea bites all over your body and you just can't stand it anymore, right? So vernacular is not simply a second class failed attempt to describe. It is a multiple valence against the hegemony, which is cultural force plus consent, for any of you guys who read Gramsci, of the dominant culture. If that thing sounds weird, think, of how hip, think about hip hop and how rap changes the way in which people speak. Rap changes the meaning of words, which gets absorbed into the dominant language by white kids who listen to music, start saying like, yo, bro, or whatever, right? No, it, just, just follow this. And then it gets put in dictionaries as new definitions. Look at the word dope, which is one that I used to make people look at all the time. It was glue for airplanes in the 50s. In the 60s, it was marijuana. And in the 90s and the 2000s, dope means awesome, right? When you say something is the shit, what does that mean? That's a word that's obscene. It can't be mentioned. But it, the language of the outliers has flipped it on its head. Being, if something is the shit, it's the best there is, right? Now, it doesn't have to be accepted by the entire culture to be powerful, so like, don't go there about that. But it does exist that way, okay. So now, the point is that language and meaning are constantly changing. The idea that a dictionary can put down a word and have it be all there is, that's baloney. Somebody taught you that who wanted to save the language. Culture is conservative by its nature. Language is always changing. That's crucial. Not because the dominant culture wants it to change, because they don't, because culture's basic function is to be conservative. And I can't get into that too much now, but just believe me. The reason words change is because marginalized people exercise their agency and their inventiveness and their cleverness. Okay, so we're going to leave the world of hip-hop for a second because we're going to go to the world of a famous Russian linguist for a minute. Okay, the use of language requires an understanding of context which elucidates the meaning. It, Chaucer, you know, you may not ever take a linguistics class, Chaucer said language and meaning are identical, baloney. Bakhtin, uh, Mikhail Mikhailovich Bakhtin says that without context, you never understand. And he uses the um, example with three words, all of which are one syllable, O-H-M-Y-G-O-D, which could be, oh my God, or oh my God, praying, right? And you wouldn't know which it were, was until, unless you were there to hear it. So context really matters in the, what, in, the, in the use of language. Just write that down. Context matters. It does in your papers, too. If they don't know what the hell you're talking about, they're never <laughs> going to give you an A. Okay. So English-only speakers uh, see themselves as transparently clear, and that is a function of power, not of the quality of the language, right? And monolingualism comes at a very, very high cost because we are separated from all of the other options that meaning could bring to us, right? All, and we're going to talk about a few of those later. So our friend Bakhtin, who was a Russian linguist in the night, like 1895 or 7 was his first book. So we're talking about the same time as post-emancipation when the Harlem Renaissance is rocking. Here's Bakhtin. He's in you know, someplace like Murmansk, tearing up his manuscripts because he's a super smoker, and he leaves these fabulous manuscripts that have big holes in them. Um, that's, another, that's another story, too. But anyway, context is everything, and your choice of language implies the acceptance of the ideology behind it. And by ideology, we mean its inherent associations. So it's a complex idea, but clearly Diaz, when he tells us he writes in non-English, accepts that this way of speaking implies something different than it did for DeBose or for Washington. It's more valent, it's more complex because it isn't binary, it has many Englishes, many languages, all of which have inherent associations, and this is another one of his great achievements, and so we have a piece here.
Now this is at the Jewish Community Center in San Francisco, um, and the interviewer is a guy from the theater that's in the intersection for the arts, but I can't call it right now. I came up being told that the way I spoke and write wasn't English for so long that I'm always like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a non-English, you know? So in my mind, I always thought it was kind of English, but so, so often people were like, you know, it's sort of if you have an accent and people are like, you don't speak English. I felt like I had this permanent accent called Spanish. Okay, so that's right on it. <clears throat> so we have another question. How do you insert yourself into a narrative which does not allow for your existence in the first place? It's really crucial. It doesn't matter if you're not a, a power person. It doesn't matter what your lack of power is. If you want to enter into the conversation, uh, how do you get that job, that book written? Because the people that read the books to publish are not people like you. You have to be extraordinarily exceptional for one thing, but you have to articulate yourself in a very interesting way, and that gets you published. So our hero, Oscar, right, he comes from nowhere, and he's destroyed within the novel, and all that remains of him is this continual conversation about him between Lola and Junior. The novel itself is the only proof of his existence. So Juno Diaz writes that reality is not necessarily a good venue for some people's lives. <laughs> now think about what he's saying. He writes in Oscar Wow about a character that we're going to read aloud from if I don't talk too much, um, that uh, folks always underestimate what the promise of a lifetime of starvation, powerlessness, humiliation can provoke in a young person's character. That's on page 119. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, when he from Colombia, have you ever heard of him? Labyrinth of Solitude, no, okay. He said, we, and this is in his acceptance of the Nobel Prize for Literature. He said, we have had little to ask of the imagination. Our crucial problem has been a lack of a conventional means to render our lives believable. And I think that this, the novel, has turned out to be that and I think that Juno Diaz is one of the great uh, presenters of that point of view. Now, Scott Mamaday, who is uh, Kiowa, who went to Stanford, who wrote a book called Way to Rainy Mountain, which is another fabulous book that I, I talk about a lot. Um, he writes about a woman called Kosan, a Kiowa woman that he knew, but he never really met. And he's, uh, he figures, this ch uh, childhood figure, is very important in the way to Rainy Mountain. And she comes out of the words when he's typing. He, this is in an essay. And I, when I read this, I was so struck by how brilliant it was. He's typing along this essay. And he, he keeps seeing, he's like, you know, that kind of fatigue you have when you waited a little too long to get your paper and your eyes are crossing. And he looks at the screen and Kosan's name keeps coming out. And then all of a sudden, she's right here beside him. And he says to her, you can't be real. And she says, if I'm not real, then certainly you're not either, <laughs> because I exist in your imagination. And then she turns around and she recedes into the paper again with only her name. So the, I, the life of the imagination which creates these characters is one way of reality. It's not the only way, Kosan says, but it's crucial. And then um, I'm going to skip over most stuff so we can get to some more things. So now we're going to watch. Is Hilton Owls? Okay, now listen to this carefully. Do you know who Hilton Owls is? He's the black guy on the left. Um, Hilton Owls just turned out an awesome book called White Girls, but he is uh, an editor and writer for The New Yorker, which is the privileged white magazine of all time, right? He's just super awesome. And uh, I didn't used to like him, but I've gotten to like him a lot better as he's grown in his writing. 
So here's Hilton House, who's a product of this diaspora, and Juno Diaz, who's got a real problem with his back and can hardly stand up. He, he stands around like this when he talks and his hands go, you know, he has a split nerve or something like that. So let's listen to him. Where it came from, my concepts of what I was going to write about came from being the kind of the kind of the reason they're trying to shut down all the ethnic studies programs. They're trying to shut down all the ethnic studies programs in this country, yeah, because they don't want to produce students like they produce out of ethnic studies programs who begin by, you know, begin by saying, yo, it's fucked up we're not talking about us. Right. And I think I'm a product of these programs and they're the ones who aimed me directly towards writing about this tiny bullshit neighborhood that nobody really, kind of knew or thought about when I was growing up. And I just, you know, it's an old pattern, but one that's super reliable. Mm -hmm. You know, you think we're so erased. I mean, you know this. It's like, if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, if you're from a poor family, if you're from like a rural family, if you're from like a family who work like dogs and never got any respect or a share of the profits, you know that 99% of your stories ain't been told in any fucking medium. And so, and yet, we still have to be taught to look and to tell our stories. For many of us, that's something that we have to like stumble our way through. You know, it's despite the utter absence of us, it's still an internal revolution to say, wait a minute, we are not only like worthy of great art, but the source of great art. For many of us, it takes a lot of work to get there. Holy cow, right? It's just a casual question. Um, so we have this new concept that he enga that Diaz engages in in his writing. First off, he has a gift to write. If you haven't read Drown, I suggest it to you that oh, my, everything he writes is breathtaking. And it also appears in The New Yorker. So, uh, and so we got two guys from The New Yorker there, both of whom are people of color, who are writing some of the most exceptional literature that's printed today. Right, and the New Yorker usually does a pretty good job of picking uh, what's going to be published and what isn't. So now we have the big kahuna, intertextual narrative history. And I can tell you right now that it is a literary device, but it's a powerful tool. What does it mean, literary device? It's not like a metaphor or a simile or something. But how do you insert yourself into a world that you don't exist in, even though you do exist? How do you fill in the lacuna and, and the, the holes in the narrative? Through this method I call intratextual narrative history, meaning within the text. And so what does Juno Diaz do? He writes the story of Oscar, right? And Bela, and all of these wonderful characters. Did you go and La India? I mean, these people will live forever. If you read them out loud, you will love them. But here we go. So this is intertextual narrative history. The accepted history of the Dominican Republic is both contested and supported by the life of Oscar. It's co-joined when the love of Oscar's life turns out to be the mistress of one of Trujillo's lieutenants. Now that's the literary device. What's the genius about it? Well. We know the history of Trujillo and the DR from reading the, it's not exactly a footnote, it's a parallel text. It's intratextual narrative, right? Uh, and it exists beside the fictional one. So we have Oscar, who's clearly fictional because she disappears and we only know about the words. But Trujillo and all of those things exist in the history books that if we read them, but he brings them into the novel so that those of us who refuse to admit that the Dominican Republic even exists, will know something about the history of that country. That's genius to me. Now, Scott Marmaday used it in the way of Randy Mountain. His, te his technique was to have three texts that were on the page. They said that book would never get published. It's one of the, right up there with the Bible, in terms of what people read. The, the man who talked about Kosan appearing the life of the imagination is an equal life to the one that we live, right? Okay. So it could be called a literary device, but I'm telling you it's a powerful tool. It's also used by um, Asiya Jabbar 
in a book you probably ought to read if you have time to read anything. I never did. Uh, that's called Algerian Cavalcade. And she writes as a Berber from within the harem, and um, she writes about a letter. I'm just going to tell you this so you know how it parallels. She gets a letter from somebody who writes her in French. And she said, I don't even know who these words could belong to. She speaks two other languages, but not French. So the letter comes to her, and then it gets lost. And someone else gets to read it. And my God, that's my life. And of course, people who are raised uh, the way that Asia Jabbar was raised. Now, she's gone on to be at Harvard, so like, she's not a chump either. Um, the way she was raised, uh, find that she's violated in some way by having being referred to as Fr in, in French. Because she never even saw her mother get a postcard. Her mother's name was never mentioned outside of the confines of her house, because that's the, the way the law was for her in Algeria. But her father sends a postcard to her mother, and then all of a sudden, the postman sees the card. It's a violation of her. But anyway, so here she is talking about the history of Algeria, and the Algerian war, and the resistance of the people of Algeria. And if you know anything about Algeria, the next thing that comes to your mind is Franz Fanon, right? Because he's a shrink and he's an architect of the Algerian Revolution. You, so this is like all jumbled up in stories that she tells. But it's intertextual narrative history. The his history's there. We know what it was like to stand on the rooftops and see the invasion of Algeria. The Berber people were not, women were not allowed outside of their personal area. Right? But she writes that for us. She writes about the postcard coming in a different language, which also just sort of tears up the narrative the way that it's been previously described. And I could talk to you about that book forever, but I can't. So we know that there are some. And there are also Antonio Benitez Rojo's uh, The Repeating Island, which is, I, he is now dead. And every day I, I miss him because of what he contributed to my life and to the world of books. But he says, I re he's had this fabulous uh, series of writings in Repeating Island. And then just all of a sudden, I remember the day with exactitude when I realized that the old ways of Cuba and the new way of being in the world were not going to end. And then he disappears. But he enters the text. He puts flesh on the bones. It's like a real thing for him. I remember the day with exactitude. That I, he's a little boy in shorts. What he's talking about is the Kennedy um, what do you, Bay of Pigs. And he found that there was another way to be in the world. OK. So the parallel text of Diaz is joined to Oscar, right? when he focuses on the obscene rule of Trujillo, the Dominican Republic, and um, it is historically accurate, his definition of that. And the factual history appears at the lower margins of the page in the book, which I already told you. In one case, Diaz mentions two people that I want to bring up, because uh, we don't hear about them in our culture. One is Hatue, and the other is Ana Canoa. Now, these are two historical characters characters who literally resisted. Anna Canoa was a poet, and she was a queen. Her beauty and captivating presence were recorded by Columbus. Columbus was basically not really interested until he realized he'd lost everything in talking about what he actually saw or what wonderful things there were. But for a man with Columbus's mission to talk about someone like Anna Canoa as being captivating and being beautiful and being a poet flies in the face of almost everything. She must have been truly an exceptional woman. Now, Edwidge Danicat, who wrote that uh, about Diaz in the first part, has a beautiful essay about her. So you could find that. It's on the internet, I'm sure. The Las Casas translated Columbus's diaries, right? And here, Anna Canoa is hung in deference because of her, uh, um, what do you call that? In her, her inherent power, what she projected 
amongst people. All of her people had their heads cut off, right? But not on a canoa. She was hung. Why is that important? Now, this is all from a footnote, right? It's about this much. You need to unpack this. Add some water, and it turns into one of those aquarium things. But Anna Canoa was critical because every person who came as an interloper to the Americas at, for the first long period of time was Spanish. And all the Spanish were Catholics. And Catholics believed that if you lost your head, you could never make it to the resurrection. That's why they saved her. Just because. She's so awesome. Maybe there's something we don't know. But Hatue, who was another king of another group of people on this island, runs away to Cuba to avoid Columbus. Smart move, right? Columbus goes after him, slaughters him, everyone that was with him. So we want to talk about Hatui for a second. And I just want to show you a couple of slides so you can see what happens in this process of erasure. Diaz writes about Hatui and says he was coffled to a beer in a country not his own. Now, what does that mean? It's pretty bad, right? Coffled to a beer in a country not his own. Why coffled? Now, he gets one sentence, and I can talk about it for 20 minutes. So you know this is a compact super book, right? Because the coffles were the people that held the slaves. Where is Hatui now? He's coffled to a beer can in Cuba, the country that's not his own, right? And who are his associates here? Hatui fled to Cuba. He's now a beer Okay, now we have the reference to the chains of slaves, etc. Now this solemn Hatue, right? It looks pretty damn solemn to me. In effigy on the label of the beer can, in ads which show foreign tourists, rumba dancers, so he is deterritorialized. He is completely robbed of the culture and the meaning that he had, right? He's castrated completely. A figure whose history was primarily resistance is annihilated in the dominant text. Is it getting late? She's, well, OK. I'm not going to be able to read out loud to you, I don't think. He is the territorialist. OK, so Hatui is the ultimate Colombian conquest. He's effaced, emasculated, and separated from his heroism. There's nothing to recommend him but an alcohol drink. Juno Diaz gives us a very clear narrative history of his erasure. And he is resuscitated by Diaz for you as the readers. So to speak about re-territorialization of the Dominican Republic, of his almost friendless Oscar, Diaz puts the Dominican Republic on your intellectual map. It interrupts the dominant conversation in the same way that hip hop became the CNN of the Bronx, as Dan Ducat said in the first slide, in your face. So when we, to complete this conversation, we can ask, what else does Diaz's description contribute to language and poetics? Description places flesh on the bones. And I'm going to have to stop here because we're out of time. But I want to give you three things you can write down and you can go home and read them and play like I read them to you. This is the best part. I love reading aloud. The first one is our poor pal Oscar. Everybody, he says, everybody else going through the terror and joy of their first crushes, their first kisses, while Oscar sits in the back of the class behind his DM screen and watches his adolescent stream by. It sucks to be left out of adolescence. Sort of like getting locked in the closet on Venus when the sun appears for the first time in 100 years. You know what Oscar's problem is. Can't you just taste it? I think it's awesome. That's on page 23. We have the patriarch Abelard um, on page 215. He talks about his, his life and whatever. He says, and given that you could get lit up for even mispronouncing that failed cattle thief's name, it was a no-brainer, really. Niggas who messed with him ended up with a bad case of the deads. That is on page 215. You can go back and look at it. And here's how he sees the landscape, a beautiful selection on page 135. 
At some point, they pass through one of those godforsaken blisters of a community that frequently afflict the arteries of, between major cities. Sad assemblage that have been deposited in situ by a hurricane or some other calamity. The only visible commerce was a single goat carcass hanging unfetchingly from a rope, peeled down to its corded orange musculature, its face intact as if it were wearing a mask. That's on page 135. So his work is also filled with humor, with what we call dicho. Uh, if you speak Spanish, they call bon mot in France, which once again is the uh, hearkening back to French. Dicho is a much better word. Uh, and he says, that's white people for you. Lose a cat, and it's an all points bulletin. But we Dominicans, if we lose our daughter, we're not even likely to cancel our manicure appointment. Now, this is a very problematic thing, but then Oscar says, Nothing is more exhilarating than saving yourself by the simple act of waking. That's on page 201. So we go on and we go on. And then we have on uh, page 147 another really beautiful one. And I wanted to read to you, which I cannot, about El Hollywood. Uh, page 114 and 115. Read it out loud. Think about this girl sitting on the bar chair with shoes that are too big, too young to drink. She's an interloper in this bar, and the music comes on, and she can dance. And she dances until even the band leader said, the woman's on fire, right? And then she meets up with this gangster who looks like he just came out of, who's not sweating at all. Her perm is a mess. I almost said fucked up. Her perm is a mess. Her life is a mess. Her feet hurt. But he's been watching her and the way she moves when she's in her element. And that's a good metaphor for a lot of things in this book. And uh, he picks her up. So in closing, <laughs> and I have to close, I don't really have any conclusion to this paper. But what I do want to point out is that the genius of Diaz is in creating characters who are vital and funny and terribly pathetic. They live in a heteroglossaic world of a trilingual imagination within the history of the Americas, all the while being contrary to the dominant cultural discourse. Diaz and his characters fly in the face of more historical narratives, but he does, he does what he does in a book which is structured to change the format of the novel itself. Thanks. Do, do we have any, my five minutes even? All right. So I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't get to reading aloud because that's the best part, you know, lighten that shit up a little bit. Does anybody have a question that they want to ask? What is my email address, for example, if you're going to write me and say what it's all? Did you sign your uh, Ruben? You want, they have to sign that they were here? Yes, ma'am. Um, you talked about the parallel taxes in history, and I, I haven't finished the book, but I did enjoy that. But I have a question about something also that recently came up in the news. So two things related to him putting a history in a fictional one being, what's his authority to really... Hold on, guys. Hold on just a second. There's one thing to say with your What is his authority as a you know, creative writer or a writer to put history? And furthermore, did you see the most recent interview with the Trujillo assassin where he contradicted the history of um, Kennedy and behind that? So well, I, I may mean, have seen it. That's another different conversation. What right does he have to do that? Because he is a creative writer. That's his job. So no, the history is irrefutable, what he has in there. Now, if you're saying that one of Trujillo's assassins says that he never did it, what would you expect him to say? I'm guilty? No, that Kennedy, no, he says that Kennedy. But Kennedy's not part of the story. Well, it's in the footnote, one of the first footnotes in there, he says Kennedy is the one who got that assassin to kill Trujillo. That's part of the history in the parallel text. I thought that's what you were talking about. Okay. Okay, that's, that's something that, okay, you're, you're right, it is, it is, that part is there, it's in the first part. It's not in the part about Hatue, et cetera. Um, I think that you have to recognize that uh, the jury is gonna be out, we will never know who did what, but I think that his historical narrative is, within certain limits is extremely valid, and um, if you, he's obviously not on the, uh, the side of the, the United States government invaded the DR and is part of the reason that all these uh, people are in diaspora in New Jersey. So it's, it's, that's a complex, and it's a really good question. But the bottom line is, 
when you're writing something, he does write a valid historical narrative. It is not the only narrative about these things which exists. That's our way of looking at it. It's right, and that's the only one. That's epistemological. It's just not the case. And we will never know all of the awful things that Trujillo did, and we will never have the people who did those things admit to what they did. I mean, even Hitler didn't say he killed anybody. You know? And so these things are uh, c contested, and some will be washed through the sands of time, and they'll come out okay. But it's a good question. And like I say, I don't have any answers to anything. Does anybody have one more that they want to ask? Okay, then you're free to go. Thank you. <laughs>